may not be done with all of them, but let's take a look and see how you're doing so far. So number one up here, we are multiplying. Remember, when we multiply, we combine the counts, and then we also combine the names. So we've got 8 times 11, which is 88. And then we multiply each name separately. And remember, when we multiply exponents with the same base, we add the powers. We're still multiplying, but the appearance is we're adding powers. So we have a to the third and a to the fifth combined to give us a to the eighth. Good. Three plus five is eight. Now we've got a b in this one, but not in this one. So what do we do? We just have a b and then c squared. So 88, a to the eighth, b, c squared. Is it all right if I move the b and the c around? Because c it's okay if you switch them around, but remember we talked a little bit last week about grammar, and it's more correct to have them in oh, alphabetical, order. alphabetical order. Yep. I did it by order of uh, exponents. Okay. If you have multiple digits, like if you have 7x to the third plus 2x to the fifth minus 8, then, you know, this is just one digit here. Right. One number and its name, one count and its name. Here there are three digits. Then it's more correct to have the highest power first. Okay. 2x to the fifth is the highest power. It's a positive 7x to the third and a negative 8. Okay, this next one here, we're dividing. And the, remember, division follows the same rules as multiplication. So we divide the counts. 42 divided by 7. Seven. 6. And then when we divide exponents with the same base, we are subtracting the powers. So x to the 7th divided by x to the 3rd. x to the 4th. Now be careful with this one. y to the 3rd divided by y to the 5th. What's 3 minus 5? Negative 2. Negative 2. There we go. Y to the negative 2. Any questions so far? Okay, now number 3. We're going to a power. Same thing. 5 to the power of 4 is 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 or 625. Very good. When we take a, an exponent to another power, the appearance is that we're multiplying the powers. So m to the fourth to the power of four is m to the 16. Because m to the fourth to the power of four, that's m to the fourth times m to the fourth times m to the fourth times m to the fourth, right? That would be 8, 12, 16. P to the 7th to the power of 4 is P to the 28. Very good. Any questions there? Well, let's move down to our fractions. Reduce, remember, means... If you can divide both the numerator and denominator by the same number, do it. Now, looking at this one, there's a larger number we can divide by. But we don't have to do it all at once. If I look at this, I see both of those end in 0. So what does that mean they can both be divided by? 10. So I'm going to do that first. 60 divided by 10 is 6. And 150 divided by 10 is 15. Now, is there anything else I can divide them both by? 3. Very good. 6 divided by 3 is? 2. 2 and 15 divided by 3? 5. So 2 fifths. We could have divided both of those by 20 right away. And if you saw that, or not 20, um, 30 I should say, right away. And if you saw that, that's wonderful. But if not, as you can see, we can just do it in 2 or 3 or more steps. 60 over 36. There's actually a couple of things we're going to be able to do here. What can both of those be divided by? Six works. Two, or we could have done two or three would have worked as well. What's 60 divided by six? 
10 and 36 divided by 6? 6. Now we can still divide both of those by another number. What is it? 2. two. What is 10 divided by 2? 5. Five. And 6 divided by 2 is 3. Now at that point, I would say we're not quite done reducing it yet. Because we can still split that into a mixed number. Five thirds, we have five pieces, and it takes three of them to make a whole object. So we can get one whole object out, and how many left over? Two thirds. So one and two thirds. If you are asked to reduce, often they ask you to put your answers in simplest form. They mean both reduce and convert to mixed numbers if possible. Unless they say leave your answers as the simplest improper fraction, that would mean you would leave it here. But usually if they say simplest form, they mean both reduce and convert to, to mixed numbers. Over here now, number six. They want us to take these mixed numbers and convert them back into improper fractions. So 3 and 2 fifths. What do I do first? Multiply 3 times 5. 3 times 5 is? 15. 15. And then what? Plus, two. Plus the 2 is? 17. 17 fifths. Very good. Over here, 5 and 1 eighth. What do I start with? 5 times 8 is? 40. And plus 1 is? 41 over 8. Very good. So now, looking at all this stuff, there's a couple of next steps that I want to do. The first one is this. What if a fraction is raised to a power? Well, not multiply, but raise them to the power, right? Oh. Two-fifths to the third power is two-fifths times two-fifths times two-fifths. And when we multiply fractions, we would be multiplying the top, the numerators, right? Two times two times two is just two to the third power. Five times five times five is just five to the third power. We're going to come back to that more after we've done more operations with fractions. Our next step, what if our fraction, for us to reduce a fraction, what if our fraction looks like this? And we're asked to reduce it. Well, remember, last week we talked about factoring. And I had happened to mention that factoring is used with fractions in a lot of different ways. One of the ways that factoring is used with fractions is in reducing. So I'm going to put this one on, on hold for a second, and I'm going to give us another example. Let's say that I have 18 thirtieths, and I ask you to reduce that. Well, I could factor 18 if I did the factor tree. 18 is divisible by 2. That would leave me with 9. 2 is prime. 9 is divisible by 3, which would leave me with 3. Those are both prime. So 18 is 2 times 3 times 3, right? 30, I could do the same thing with. 30 is divisible by 10. That leaves me with 3. 3 is prime. 10 divides into 2 and 5. Those are both prime. So 30 is 2 times 3 times 5. 
when I go to reduce a fraction, what we were doing was dividing the numerator and denominator by the same number. Well, in essence, all we were doing was canceling out common fractions or common factors. I can divide the top and bottom both by a 2. All it does is take away that 2. It cancels it out. If I divide the top and bottom both by a 3, it cancels out the 3. 3 fifths. If I reduced 18 thirtieths, I would get 3 fifths. I would probably start out, since they're both even, I'd probably divide by 2 first and then divide by 3, which is exactly what we did by canceling out those factors. Or since 2 times 3 is 6, I could have divided both of them by 6 and we'd have been there. So now back over to here, how do we factor it when there's variables there? Well, 18, we said, is 2 times 3 times 3. x to the fifth is just 5x's. y squared is just 2y's. 45, I can factor the same way. It's going to be 3 times 3 times 5. I'm going to assume you guys can do the factor tree. And then x squared is x times x. y to the third is y, 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 which I'm sure you guys ask yourselves a lot when I'm giving you homework, right? So now I can cancel out a 3 and another 3. What, the, what I basically just did there is I took the 18 over 45. I can either divide by 3 twice or just divide by 9, right? We get two-fifths, which is what's left, 2 over 5. And then I do the same thing with my variables. I cancel out an x. Then I can cancel out two y's. What I'm left with now is I have three x's on top. So I have the two-fifths from here. Three x's on top is x to the third, right? What about the y? It's on bottom. So I'm going to ask you this question. Why did the x end up on top and the y end up on bottom? Because in the original problem, the larger power of x was on top. So when you canceled them out, x's were going to be left on top, right? For y's, Larger powers on bottom. So when you cancel them out, the Y is going to be left on bottom. That's where the extra ones are going to be. Where did the numerical value of the power come from? Exactly. If we go back up here to our division, how did we get the X to the fourth? Yeah, three, 7 minus 3 gives us 4. Same thing happens down here. It was 5 minus 2 gave us 3, x to the third. Now, for the y, the larger power was on bottom, so the y ended up on bottom. But then I still subtract the powers. 3 minus 2 is 1, so it's y to the 1, or just y. But it comes from factoring. So I might have... something like this, and I ask you to reduce it, what I would do, unless you want to just factor it out and cancel, which is just fine, that'll always work, because that is technically what we're doing. That is the real way or the long way of doing it. But for me, if I'm going to take a couple shortcuts on it, I pull out the numbers first. 9 twelfths. What can I divide both 9 and 12 by? 3. Okay, what's 9 divided by 3? 3. What is 12 divided by 3? 4. Can I divide those by anything else? No. No. So I end up with 3 fourths of the numerical part of my answer. 3 over 4. Now I have the variables. 
x to the fourth and x squared. Where is the x going to go, top or bottom? On top. It is going to be in the numerator because the larger power was on top. What's the power going to be? Two. Two, two because? Four minus two is two. Very good. So we might have... Sixty-five, a to the fifth, b to the fourth, c, over fifty-two, a to the seventh, b, c squared. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to start out with the numbers. Sixty-five over fifty-two. What can both of those be divided by? Now I made this one tricky on purpose. What? Well, let's go through our progression. They don't end in zero, so they can't be divided by 10. 65 divides by 5, but 52 doesn't. Are they both even? No, so they can't divide by 2. 6 plus 5 is 11, so they don't divide by 3. So our standard ones don't work. So what ones do we try if 10, 5, 2, and 3 don't work? We have to try 7, 11, 13, 17, those prime numbers are the ones we would try next. Can I divide those by 7? Well, 65 divided by 7 is 9.28571428.6 approximately, right? So that doesn't divide by 7 evenly. How about divided by 11? No. 65 divided by 11 is 5. Point... Anybody? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. It's 5.9090090. So it doesn't divide by 11. How about 13? Yes, yeah. yeah, 65 divided by 13 is 5. 52 divided by 13? 4. 4. Now you'll also notice right now that this is what? It's an improper oh. fracture. The numerator is larger than the denominator. However, because there's variables in here, we cannot make this into a mixed number. The reason being is A, B, and C are variables. Those variables have a numerical value. We just don't know what it is. If this were just 5 fourths, yeah, we would certainly break it into 1 and 1 fourth. But it's not 5 fourths. 5 fourths are just the coefficients here. But the A, B, and C have numerical, va numerical values. So we don't know if this is an improper fraction or not. Depending on the values of A, B, and C, this may be a proper fraction. So all that tells us is in our answer, there's a 5 in the numerator and a 4 in the denominator. So what do we do with A? First of all, is it going to be on top or bottom? It's going to be on the bottom. It's going to be on the bottom because 7 is bigger than 5. What power is it going to have? 2. 2. Very good. 7 minus 5 is 2. How about B? Top or bottom? Top. top. What power? Three. Three. 3. 3. Very good. We think of this as 1, so 4 minus 1 is 3. C. Top or bottom? Bottom. Bottom, power of C. just 1 or C. just C. Very good. So that's it. Any questions? Well, then I think it's time for you guys to try one. How come on the practice questions for number 2, you know, the first questions we did, how come... That one was a negative 2. Okay. The y has a negative 2 power. Very good. I was hoping somebody would notice that. Um, at that point, we hadn't learned how to reduce fractions yet. Technically, 
that negative 2 power is correct, but it would have been better grammar to write it like that. So the Y would have been on bottom. But, what? Yeah. But Y to the power of negative 2 is equivalent to 1 over Y squared. A negative power is a reciprocal. It's a negative times a negative. Yes, it would be, yeah. Okay, one for you to try in your notes. Forty two X to the seventh Y Z third over fifty six X to the fifth Y to the third Z to the third. Give that one a shot in your notes. So forty two over fifty six. What can both of those be divided by? They can both be divided by 7. What is 42 divided by 7? 6 and 56 divided by 7? 8. Are we done? No. no. They can both be divided by 2. 2. Very good. Giving us 3 over 4. 3 over 4. Perfect. So up here in our answer, we know there's going to be a 3 in the numerator and a 4 in the denominator. How about the x? Top, squared, good. The larger power was the 7 on top. 7 minus 5 is 2, so x squared goes on top. How about y? Y squared on the bottom. Y squared on the bottom. Again, the larger power was on bottom. That was the 3. 3 minus 1 is 2, so y squared. And z? It cancels out. It divides out. So the z disappears. So it is 3x squared over 4y squared. Any questions? Not as bad as it looks, right? Okay, well... Just to make sure we've got this one down, because I don't remember how much we hit it last week. 2x to the 5th, y to the 7th, to the power of 9. We are going to take the 2 to the power of 9. What is 2 to the 9th power? 512. 512. Very good. That's 9 2s multiplied together. So it's 512. I hear you. It definitely feels like a Monday, doesn't it? So now our x to the fifth to the power of 9 is? 45. Very good. We do multiply the powers. And then y to the power of? 63. Good. 7 times 9 is 63. Any questions on those? Okay, well, another application of this fractional format of the number that looks the same but has some slightly different, different applications to it, some different functions to it, is a ratio. And a ratio is nothing more than a comparison of two numbers. So for a ratio, I might compare students that are in the classroom with me to students on the network.
So right now there are three students in the classroom and six students on the network. I could write that as a fraction, 3 over 6, 3 to 6. I could write it as with a colon, 3 to 6 like that. Or I could write it with the word 2, 3 to 6. I prefer to write it as a fraction because with it in that format, 3 over 6 or 3 to 6, there are a lot of things I can do with it that are similar to what I can do with a fraction. Both 3 and 6 can be divided by 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. 6 divided by 3 is 2. So that is the 3 to 6 ratio is equivalent to a 1 to 2 ratio. For every one student in the classroom with me, there are two students on the network. Now there are some advantages. This one's just shortcut, shorthand for this one. There are some advantages to this last format of 3 to 6 because it tells us something. And there are two types of ratios that we deal with. This particular ratio compares one part to the other part. might be looking at it and thinking, well, that's pretty obvious. Isn't that what a ratio does? Well, there's a second type of ratio that would compare one part to the whole thing. And that would be saying that there are three students in the classroom with me out of nine total students today. Notice those are both the same ratio, it's just a different way of expressing it. Here I have, there's three in the classroom to the six that are on the network. Here there's three in the classroom out of the nine total. That nine, in this case, includes the three plus the other six. So having that wording as three to six implies that those are two separate pieces. Three out of nine implies that the three is included in the nine. So it's a little bit clearer to have it in words like that. But as a fraction, mathematically, it's easier to work with. So just so that you are aware that those fractions, those ratios, anytime you see a ratio, there are, there's more than one ratio implied within it. The third ratio here, by the way, would be if 3 out of 9 are in the classroom, 6 out of 9 are on the network. So there are three ratios implied there in that situation. Um, I might look at, I think you got similar tables in most of your, well, you guys are in computer labs, so they're a little bit different. But I'm going to look at the tables in the classroom here. We're going to look at a length. to width ratio. Um, these tables here are 18 inches wide. And for the sake of argument, we're going to say 81 inches long. I know they're not. They're actually 72, but it makes it nice. Works better for my purposes mathematically if they're 81. Now I said length to width, so I'm going to put the length first. 81 inches over the width of 18 inches. First thing I see is that the inches divide out, the units divide out. Both 18 and 81 can divide by 9. What's 81 divided by 9? 9. 9. 18 divided by 9? 2. So that is a 9 to 2 ratio of length to width. Notice the units divided out, first of all. The inches are gone. A ratio is unitless. It does not matter whether that's 9 inches to 2 inches, or 9 feet to 2 feet, or 9 centimeters to 2 centimeters. All that is saying is there are 9 units of length for every 2 units of width, regardless of what those units are. 
The other thing you will notice is I left this as 9 over 2. I did not make it 4.5. I did not make it a mixed number. Just like with the algebraic numbers, we never turn a ratio into a mixed number because a remember a ratio is a comparison of two numbers. If I were to make that into a mixed number, it's no longer a comparison between two numbers anymore. So I do have to leave a ratio like that. Another thing you, you might have noticed here, in both of the ratios I've done so far, we've compared like things. For example, this was students to students. And therefore, those units canceled out, and I had no units in my answer. Here it was inches to inches, and again, they canceled out, so my answer had no units in it. A ratio must always compare two things with the same label or the same units. They must have the same name to be in a ratio. For example, I could have 2 feet to 18 inches. That is not a ratio. But I can convert it into a ratio by changing 2 feet into 24 inches. Now it is a valid ratio, and the inches cancel out. Both 24 and 18 can be divided by 6. 24 divided by 6 is? 4. and 18 divided by 6? 3. 3. So that is a 4 to 3 ratio. Now another thing that might be a little bit weird with our ratios is... Oh, let's say that last semester I had, or last year, between the two sections last year, I had 46 students pass and four students fail. So obviously the students divide out. 46 and 4 can both be divided by... I didn't do that. Let's make that 48 students passed. So 48 and 4 can both be divided by what? Okay, they can both be divided by 2. 48 divided by 2 is? 24. 4 divided by 2? 2. Are we done? No, they can both be divided by? 2. 24 divided by 2? Is 12 and 2 divided by 2 is 1. Now, if this were a fraction, a simple fraction, I would just call that 12, wouldn't I? But remember, a ratio is a comparison between two numbers, so we have to leave that as 12 over 1 or 12 to 1. What if we compare two numbers that are not the same? Let's say. We send Robin here on a road trip. And Robin goes 365 miles in seven hours. There is no way that I can make those have the same unit, same name. I cannot convert miles into hours, and I cannot convert hours into miles. So this is not a ratio. This is what we refer to as a rate. So there are two big differences between rates and ratios. And that's the first one. A rate can compare two things with different names. A ratio has to compare two things with the same name or the same label. The second big difference is a rate is almost always expressed as something called a unit rate. Up here, this would be a unit ratio because it's being compared to 1. This would not be a unit ratio because it's 4 to 3. To be a unit ratio, you would divide by the 3. That becomes a 1 and 1 third to 1. That would be a unit ratio. A little bit ugly, but it's a unit ratio. 9 to 2 would become 4.5 or 4.5 if you want to use decimals to 1. 
ratios we typically leave just in that simplest form. We don't convert them down to a unit ratio. A rate is almost always converted to a unit rate. And to do that, as I mentioned, we divide by the numerical value of the bottom number. So we divide by 7. Well, 7 hours divided by 7 is just 1 hour. 365 miles divided by 7 is 52.1428571 miles. We'd probably do some rounding. I think 52.14 miles in one hour. Now, because rates are typically presented in a unit rate like this, since the denominator is always one, we usually don't leave it in fraction form. Most of the time, we will convert it 52.14 you might write it like that, miles per hour. So the fraction is now hidden in the units. In fact, we often write it without the fraction in there at all. You might write it as 52.14 MPH, miles per hour. The fraction is still there, it's just not visible. So if I said that on this road trip, Robin gets 24 MPG. What does MPG stand for? Miles per, gallon. Miles per gallon. And even though that doesn't look like a fraction, it is. That is 24 miles over one gallon. And we need when we see this, we need to remember that it looks like that because if we're going to do any calculations with it, we have to have it in that form to calculate with it. So let's take a look at some other rates and ratios that we run into. Rates are everywhere. We already saw miles per hour, miles per gallon. Um, other rates you might run into, probably the most important one in everybody's life. There's a unit rate, $12 per hour. That is $12 over one hour. Um, you'll run into dosage rates. If you're in the medical fields, you might run into 2 milligrams per kilogram of weight. So that's 2 milligrams of that medication for every kilogram of the patient's weight. If we want to look at ratio, or yeah, ratios again. Like rates, ratios are everywhere. Um, in mechanics, let's see if you guys can guess what I'm drawing here. Sprocket. Son, that's usually the first guess. You're right, it's a sprocket. This is the part of the course where we have to use a lot of imagination because when I draw pictures, Imagination is required. You're a math instructor. Not an art teacher, that's for sure. Um, those are two sprockets. These are gears. We're going to be looking at a gear ratio. And in a gear ratio, a gear ratio is the number of teeth in the driven gear over the number of teeth In the driving gear. Well, looking at this, how many teeth does the big gear have? It has 10. How about the little one? Six. Six. Good. We don't know which one's driven or driving yet. I need to give you more information. So back to the artwork. Pretend that looks like a little electric motor. So now if I separated the two gears, which one is going to stop turning? The 10 is connected to the motor, right? So it's going to keep turning no matter what, right? 
If I separate the gears, the six tooth gear is going to stop, right? So the six tooth gear is the driven gear. It is being forced to turn by the other gear. The ten tooth gear is going to keep turning because it's connected to the motor. It is the driving gear. It is driving the other gear. It is forcing the other gear to turn. So that is a 6 to 10. And of course, that can be reduced by 2. two. That is a 3 to 5 gear ratio. Now, really, all we're doing here is comparing sizes. Because for two gears to mesh together, the teeth have to be exactly the same distance apart. So... To calculate the size, the distance around a gear, all we have to do is count the teeth. But really what we're comparing is the distance around the two gears. So if I look at a pulley ratio, there are no teeth here, but I might tell you that this is A 20 inch diameter and this here is an 8 inch diameter and I'll put the motor there it is still driven over driving so if I cut the belt which pulley stops the 20 inch that is the driven gear or the driven pulley in this case the driving pulley is the 8 inch pulley because it's going to turn whether the belt's there or not. Now the inches divide out. Both 20 and 8 can be divided by 2 or 4. We're going to go with 4. So 20 divided by 4 is 5 and 8 divided by 4? 2. This has a 5 to 2 pulley ratio. So the pulley and gear ratios mean a lot of things. One, it is the ratio of the size of the gears or the size of the pulleys. Two, it is also the ratio of the speeds of the pulleys. Now it's what we call an inverse ratio because the smaller gear or the smaller pulley will go faster than the bigger one. It is also the ratio of the power, the force that the, the gear can handle. Um, the torques must be the same, so the bigger gear will actually have a larger torque or a larger uh, force that it can withstand because it has more longer moment on it. Okay. Let's look at something not mechanical. Let's look at a construction application. In a roof. There are actually two ratios. There is a pitch and there is a slope. A lot of people, I mean, I've run a construction company for years. I was a structural engineer in the truss industry for, for quite a while. Even in the construction industry, people use these two words wrong. Now, I'm not trying to preach vocabulary to you, but I have to point it out. Pitch is height over span. Well, height, of course, let's just say that's six feet. Span is like that. Let's say that's 24 feet. So the pitch of this, six feet over 24 feet, The feet cancel out, they divide by six, it's a one-fourth pitch. Pitch is for, if you have the beam and rafter systems, it tells you how high you have to set your beam above your wall. It's one-fourth of the span is the height of your beam. Slope is rise over run. Well, the rise here is still going to be the six feet. However, the run is not the 24. The run, is the run is the distance from the lowest point to the highest point. 
So this would be the run. And how long, how far is that going to be? Half of the 24. Perfect. So 12 feet. And now, technically, we could reduce that to one half. Slope, however, is usually written as out of 12. So we cancel out the feet. We'd write that as a 6 out of 12 slope. Slope is used if you're... You, oops, go ahead. Why would you simplify the 6 of the 12? You could, write it as, you could write it as 1 half. It's just a convention okay. in construction that slope is usually written out of 12. Oh, okay. Technically what it is, is, you know, this is 6 feet and 12 feet. But technically what it is, is it's saying for every 1 foot of run... There's a six inch rise. Oh. So there's six inches of rise for every 12 inches of run. Okay. And that's, like I said, that's just an industrial standard, is all. Okay. But yeah, technically it is a one half ratio, a one to two ratio. Some other ratios that might be of importance to you. This is one that will play a role in almost everybody's life at some point. Debt to income ratio. Um, if you have a basic accounting class, you'll talk about this one a little bit. Um, debt to income in a business is a little bit different than personal, but let's take a peek at this. A debt to income ratio is your monthly debt payments. compared to your monthly gross income. So let's just say you earn $15 an hour times 40 hours a week times four weeks in a month. So that's $2,400 a month. That's your income. For debt, let's say you have a car payment. How much do you guys want to spend on a car? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> Unless you got some. 200. I heard 200 and I heard 300, so let's go 250. Um, 250 a month is about a $13,000 car. 13, 14,000. What's that? How do you leak? <laughs> um, it's just, just it's like nineteen dollars per thousand dollars of value. So ten thousand dollar car is about one hundred ninety bucks a month. Um, credit cards. Well, that's a good move. Let's say you do have credit cards that creep up to about two hundred bucks a month. I have credit cards, but I pay them off every month. So to me, it's a very, it's a free 20 or 30 day loan on stuff. Yeah. It tends to catch up to you sometimes. A house. How much do you want to spend on a house? Don't say nothing again. Unless you got that rich uncle. For rent? Oh, rent would not be a debt payment. Oh, you're talking about a mortgage? Mortgage, yeah. Okay. So what price of the house? 80000 100000 150000 What do you want to? Yeah, let's go cheap. What would you say? One fifty? Three fifty. Three hundred and fifty thousand? No, three fifty. Oh, three fifty a month? <laughs> okay. I was going to say three hundred and fifty thousand. That's getting up there. Um three hundred and fifty a month. <laughs> Three hundred and fifty a month would be about a seventy thousand dollars, seventy to eighty thousand dollar home. Now that would not be your house payment, by the way. That's your interest. That house payment would probably be about five fifty a month, because your payment would actually have to include your taxes, your one twelfth of your taxes, one twelfth of your insurance. Yep. Um, the, the, that's what mine is before all that stuff. Okay. So mine's usually like five fifty a month. Yeah, and that sounds about right, yes. 
Yeah, the 350 is what goes towards your principal and interest. So if we add that all up, that's about 800 bucks. That's no loans for boats or four-wheelers or any other toys like that. Groceries would not be debt. Groceries are an expense. So there's a difference. Or utilities, then, right? Utilities would be considered an expense and not a debt, yes. So we have $800 for debt, $2,400 for income. The dollars cancel out. $800 and $2,400 can both be divided by $100. I'll do that first. Gives me 8 over 24. What can those both be divided by? 8. 8. Very good. So 8 divided by 8 is? 1. 24 divided by 8? 3. 3. So it is a 1 to 3 debt to income ratio. A one-third debt to income ratio is an industrial standard, is a, a commercial standard of what they would want to be your maximum debt compared to your income. So if you had $2,400 a month of income, $800 a month would be considered what they would want you to be your maximum debt. Now that's just for an individual. If you're married, of course, you're, both your incomes get combined together for that. Um, but you can see that's not a lot. I mean, $800 a month is not a lot of debt payments. But they figure that other $1,600 is for taxes. You're going to lose probably three to four thousand, or three to four hundred of that for taxes. Um, then you got all your insurance, you got your groceries, your gas, your utilities. All that stuff has to be paid out of that other $1,600. Um, right now, if you go to get a loan, a little bit of a side note. You hear a lot of talk about your credit score. Well, your credit score and your debt to income ratio are equally important when it comes to getting a loan. Your credit score does not necessarily determine whether you're going to get a loan. Um, depending on the bank and the type of loan you're going to get, there are cutoffs. Like usually if you're below 575 or 600, they're going to say no. I mean, that to get that low, you had to have had a missed payment or defaulted on a loan or something that got you down that low. So you had to have some sort of, what's that? Bankruptcy. Or a bankruptcy. Bankruptcy will actually plumb you down into the low 400s. Um, so if you're down there, you've had some sort of issue that says you're a bad risk. But if you're, as long as you're above that threshold, and like I said, it can be, depending on the type of loan, it can be anywhere from 550 to 600 you're going to get the loan. What really determines it is your debt to income ratio. If you have high debt and low income, they're gonna say, no, you can't afford another loan because you don't have the monthly income to make another payment. That determines whether you are able to pay. The credit score is just talking about your history. And of course, history can change. What the credit score determines Is your rate. So if your debt to income ratio says you're making enough money that you can afford this extra payment, your credit score then says, okay, if you're at a 610, um, you might be paying 8% interest, whereas somebody who is at a 720 might be paying 2.5% interest. There are car loans out there right now uh, that were processed about Two years ago, you know, the huge dip in, in interest rates. I know people out there with car loans at 1.9% interest. At the same time, I knew people that were getting car loans as high as 12 point some percent interest because they were a bad credit risk. They had a low credit score. Um, the biggest issue that people have with this, by the way, is what I had mentioned, is running up the credit cards. You run up the credit cards, your minimum payment is what gets considered here. But your minimum payment, if you make your minimum payment, it takes like 24 years to pay off your balance. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's just it. You're paying interest plus a couple of bucks every month. That's about it. 
if uh, we get time when we get to interest or we get to percent calculations, I will show you um, based on your credit score if you get that 1.9% loan compared to getting an 8% loan on a car, what the difference is and what that car is going to cost you. It's really amazing what the difference is. Okay. So those are our rates and our ratios. Oh, another ratio I should show you. In the medical fields, there's what they call dilution ratios. A dilution ratio is taking a medication and diluting it down to a usable form. You get concentrated medications come in, and they combine them with sterile water. It's sometimes called saline solution. Um, NS called normal saline or neutral solution is the abbreviation that's used. But you'll take that concentrated medication and you'll dilute it. So you might have a 1 in 6 dilution. Now, the 1 in 6, the in is the key word here. It's not a 1 to 6. It's a 1 in 6. The in is the same as saying out of. So what this is is a ratio of one part medication or what we call concentrate to six total parts. So if we had a one in six dilution, that would be one part of medication for every six total parts. Now that's not terribly helpful in mixing it. What's more helpful in mixing it is your parts concentrate to your parts of sterile water or neutral solution. If one out of six parts is concentrate, so that's still one, how many parts of water would there be? Five out of six. Very good. Five out of six. Six minus one is five. So the ratio of concentrate to water is one to five. So for every one part of medication you put in there, you need five parts of water, five units of water. So what are these rates and ratios used for? Well, let's say we have a gear ratio of three to five. And we have a motor with a 30 tooth gear on it. I want to know how, how uh, what gear is needed for the other part. What other gear is needed? So I have the 3 to 5 gear ratio. Which of those numbers represents the gears on the motor? Now remember, the motor would be the driving gear. That's the bottom one. So there's 30 teeth on the motor. I need to find this number up here then. That would be the number of teeth that I need on the other gear. There's a couple of ways I could look at this. One way is as equivalent fractions. What do I have to multiply the 5 by to make 30? 6. 6. 5 times 6 would be 30. So 3 times 6 would be 18. What if I looked at this and I didn't see that that had to be a 6? What could I do? Okay. 30 divided by 5 equals 6, right? So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be, t what I'm really doing here is I'm taking this number divided by that number. And then I'm multiplying this by that. I took 30 times, or sorry, 3 times the 30 divided by 5. I did 30 divided by 5 to get 6, and then I multiplied the 3 by that number. There's a shortcut in math that takes this process into account. It's called 
cross multiply and divide. What it says is, of course, this number here is missing, right? The 18 isn't there. That when we're looking for the missing number in a rate or a ratio, you take the two numbers that are on the diagonal with each other, that would be the 3 and the 30, and you multiply them. 3 times 30. Then you divide by the other number. Well, if you look at what I did here, what that is saying is this is 3 times 30 divided by 5. It's just I'm taking out the parentheses and I'm doing it in a slightly different order. 3 times 30 is 90, divided by 5 is 18, just like 30 divided by 5 is 6, 3 times 6 is 18. I get to the same answer. It's just a shortcut way of looking at it. So if I have, oops, 2 fifteenths ain't going to work. Let's do 6 fifteenths, and I want to know how many 25ths that's going to be. What two numbers am I going to multiply here? Where's my diagonal? 6 times 25. Very good. Which is 150. And I'm going to divide by the 15. Very good. Which is 10. So 6 fifteenths is the same as 10 25ths. Not all, this by the way is what we call a proportion. A proportion is two equal ratios or rates. So if I'm looking at this one, not all ratios, not all proportions are missing <laughs> the top number in the second ratio. Perfect. Our diagonal goes this way. 8 times 12 is 96. And what do we divide by? We divide by the 3, which makes this a 32. So we said it's two equal ratios or rates. We might have a car that is getting Oh, let's say that it consumes 78 in 78 miles it consumes 3 gallons of gas. Want to know how far it can go on a 20 gallon tank? Well, we would cross multiply 78 times 20, which is 1,560, divided by 3, which is 520 miles. Notice, miles on top, miles on top, gallons on bottom, gallons on bottom. Our proportions must match up units. I could, if we had, if we had done dimensional analysis at this point, I could keep the units in here. In fact, the units just act like a variable. 78 miles times 20 gallons is technically 1,560 mile gallons, or gallon miles, whichever way you want to put it. And then when you divide by 3 gallons, yeah, the, the 1560 divided by 3 is 520. The gallons divide out, and you're left with just miles. Any questions? Well, sometimes our proportions get a little more complex than this. Sometimes our proportions might look like this. Three X over twenty one equals ten over 
49. That's not going to work. Let's make this 14 over 49. Here, I could cross multiply and divide, but I'd have to remember what I'm finding is not x, it is 3x. So there is another process closely related to cross multiply and divide, which is just cross multiply. And what cross multiplying is, is I'm going to multiply both diagonals, those diagonals are going to be equal. They have to be equal if the two fractions are equal. So down this diagonal, 21 times 14, I get, anybody? 294. Down this diagonal, 3x times 49, well, 3 times 49 is 157, and it's just x. Those two have to be equal. 157x has to equal 294. I must have done something wrong there, because this ain't going to work out real well. To solve, I'm going to divide by 157. So that's gone. X equals. Now I could divide that out and get an ugly fraction. Or I'm going to leave it as a fraction and reduce it. Actually, I could divide it out and get an ugly decimal, really. Both of those are divisible by 7. 294 divided by 7 is going to be 42. 157 divided by 7. Did I multiply that out right? What is 3 times 49? Did I do that right? That should be 147. That's why. Oops. That's 147. That makes the difference. That's what you guys get for trusting my answers, right? So 147 divided by 7 is 21. Then what? Divide by 7 again. You get 6 over 3. Divide by 3, it actually is 2 over 1. Or just 2. X equals 2. Now why was I able to say just 2 there instead of having to leave it as 2 over 1? Well, because x is not the ratio, it's just a part of the ratio. So it's not the whole ratio, it's just that one number within the ratio. So if I do my multiplication right, it actually does work out well. Or we might have something that looks like this. Two over five equals x plus seven over thirty. So again, we would cross multiply. I'm going to do the two numbers first. What's two times thirty? Sixty. Going this way, five times x plus seven. Perfect. Five times x is five x, and five times seven is positive thirty-five. So yes, we get. 5x plus 35 equals 60. Then what? Subtract 35. Very good. 5x equals 25. And then? Divide by 5. So x equals 5. What do you think? Good stuff? No? <laughs>
I'm going to have you guys try a couple here, and then it'll be time for a break. Let's do... Seven over five equals four x over forty. And then the other one here. X minus three over nine will equal twenty over thirty-six. Solve for x in both of those. I know some of you might not be totally finished, but let's take a look and see how you're doing. On the first one here, what would we multiply first? 7, 7 times 40, which is? What's next? Uh, 5 times 4x would be 20x. 5 times 4x is? 20x. 20x. <coughs> so 20x equals 280. What do we do with that? Divide by 20. Divide by 20. You were probably thinking reducing oh, instead yeah. of just dividing it out. 14. So x equals 14. Very good. <laughs> you just probably went divided by 10, then divided by 2. So on this one, let's do the numbers first. 9 times 20 is? 180. Now going this way, it's 36 times x minus 3. So yes, 36x and then minus 108. Very good. So 36x minus 108 equals 180. Then what? Add 108. Add 108. So 36x equals 288. And then divide by 36 gives us x equals 8. It is break time, so let's go ahead and take a break. We'll come back at 1032.